Good morning. Good morning. See, oh, still blurry today. My internet is not cooperating. How's everyone doing this morning? It's Katie Crysdale here. Friday, May 1st, new month, still the same year, still the same pandemic. Uh, let me know how you're doing today, this Friday. Do you have any plans for this weekend? What's new? What's going on where you are? How are things? Let me know. I see lots of faces I recognize. If you're new here, let us know your name, your facility. I'm gonna pop some links in the chat box right away this morning, because you guys are early birds and the early bird catches the worm. Angela says she can't believe it's May. I'm with you. I can't believe it's May either. It's can you imagine where we were in March, where we were in April, where we were in February? Things just keep going on and on. So let me post the, first I'm gonna post the show notes from Monday. So I've been catching up. I had certified pool operator classes all this week, which was really exciting. I ran my first virtual classroom. So I taught live like I'm doing right now through Click Meeting, and then my students had an invigilated exam online through a third party website. They all passed, which was really exciting. So that finished yesterday. So now I have a couple weeks a little bit quieter to get caught back up on these webinars and show notes and kind of finishing up what that looks like. So Angela is saying in Maryland, your closure has been extended through May. That's not unsurprising. I know it's been very patchwork all over the United States. And certainly in Alberta last night, our premier released some initial three phase reopening perhaps as, as early as May 14th for some things, and pools were nowhere on that list. So pools, we still have quite a bit of time. Let me go ahead and share the show notes from Monday. So I did update the show notes from Monday. The webinar recording is all online. You can grab that uh, whenever you have a chance. Really great conversation on Monday, a little bit shorter for us in terms of webinars, but I wanna throw that in the chat box. The other thing I'll let you guys know, as I said, you guys are the early birds, so I'll let you know. We are doing a competition today. We are um, giving away a free online registration for the Manitoba and Saskatchewan Virtual Aquatic Conference that's happening in two weeks. So I have been asked to speak at the Virtual Manitoba and Saskatchewan Aquatic Conference. I will be doing that on May 12th. And the Red Cross has kindly offered a free registration for one of today's webinar participants. So let me go ahead and put the Instagram post for today. If you go and comment on that Instagram post, they have said they'll give that registration to anyone in the world. You don't have to be in Canada. They will even send you the swag to the United States, to Japan, wherever you're based. So they're giving away a free registration. Let me pop the Instagram post for today's competition in the chat box. And what I'm going to ask as the secret question that we always have for our, our Instagram giveaways is I'd like you to put which session or presenter you would be most interested in hearing speak. So I'm going to put the conference program guide in the chat box. Sorry, these are quite long links. I apologize. So if you click on the program guide for the virtual conference in two weeks and have a look at the different presenters, and then in the Instagram post, let me know which session or topic or presenter you're most interested in speak, hearing speak. That will make you eligible to win the free registration that the Red Cross is giving away. 
Again, it can be anyone anywhere in the world. They will honor that if you're interested. And then if you're interested in registering for yourself, it is $70 Canadian, which is very, very affordable for an online session. Two full days of different presenters. So there's myself. I know we have John Napier from Fluid Consulting, Kevin Pace from the Canadian Red Cross. I did see, oh, I should pull it up. Who else did I see? I, lots of names that I recognized are going to be in that conference session. So welcome if you're just joining us. It's Friday, May 1st. So virtual conference, we're also going to hear from Brenda Robinson. Some of you will be familiar with Brenda. She's taught leadership courses in different Western provinces for quite a while in Canada. Shelly Dalkey will be giving a Canadian Red Cross program update. For my American friends, do be aware that the Canadian Red Cross swimming and water safety programming is quite different from the United States, but free is free. So if you want to hang out with us for two days, you want to get some free swag, anybody is eligible to enter to win. We're going to hear from Anne Porteous in BC. She's a panelist presenting. Who else is presenting? Joanna Muse is going to talk about doing virtual classrooms, online learning for aquatics. Leslie White, if you know Leslie, she's a master instructor trainer like me from St. John's Newfoundland. She was one of our panelists back in March. She will be presenting about in-service. John Napier that I mentioned, as well as some fun activities. So Michael, if you don't have Instagram, see, you must have somebody, a friend, have a friend comment for you. I'm okay with that. If you know somebody you can call, family member, friend, just get somebody to go to that post um, and get them to comment. So I will honor that. So welcome, guys. We have 15 minutes until we get started this morning. Hope you're doing well. Let me know what's new, where you are. Let me know what do you have planned this weekend. The weather today in Calgary has taken a turn for the worst. It is cold this morning. I don't know how cold, let me tell you. It's definitely close the window and put on a sweater. So it feels like 10 degrees Celsius today in Calgary, which is probably 45, 55 degrees Fahrenheit, not particularly warm. So I see different people here. I see Benjamin, Cheryl Ann, uh, Jason, Kristen, Corey, Katie, Marcy, lots of people here. As I was saying, if you came in after I started the explanation, we're doing a free giveaway today. The Canadian Red Cross has donated a free online registration for their virtual conference. The other thing I should add is you don't have to attend live. So I hear how much people are tired of live events. And I know for me, the number of people who are on these webinars is decreasing and that's fine, but people are tired and showing up live is just too hard to do. So I do know that the virtual Saskatchewan and Manitoba Aquatic Conference, they are hosting it on Click Meeting, similar to what I use. This is Click Meeting, and they will make the webinar recordings available. So you can also register fully knowing that um, you don't have to attend live. You can watch the re webinar recordings later. So Leah's here from Virginia Beach, Virginia, closed until June 10th. I think that's fair. I think there's a lot of it's interesting when I see these different Facebook comments in the different groups I belong to, people saying we're reopening in two weeks or we're reopening in three weeks. On Facebook, as you know, I don't know where each person is. It does not tell me anything other than their name. And it's so interesting to me. My husband was checking the news this morning. That's the first thing he does. And as an American, he goes to different US websites first to get the US news, then does the Canadian news. And the big thing this morning, I guess, was the conversation about meat processing. And one of the Tyson chicken plants had 940 cases, I guess, announced yesterday. So it's 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 a difficult time for everyone. And I don't want to talk just about COVID because that's not why you come here. So super excited today for Jason. Jason Simitak will be prom promoting, <laughs> presenting shortly after 11 Mountain or 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I mentioned this on Instagram this morning, but Jason and I got connected at a Alberta Recreation and Parks Association fundraiser a couple years ago. We have a um, program in Alberta where different charities and nonprofits can receive funding 
from casinos, for-profit casinos, they provide a certain percentage of revenue per night to a nonprofit that wins that slot. And so the nonprofit's responsibility is to provide staff to work in the cash room as chip runners, to doing the cash out at the end of the night. And Jason and I spent 12 hours in a cash cage at a Calgary casino. And you get to know somebody pretty well, 12 hours in a locked room with a million dollars. So that was kind of fun. And we've been on program committees since and worked together on some different projects. So I'm excited that he'll present today because he's a lot of fun. I mean, the information he's going to provide is vital, but he's also a lot of fun, which I think is what we need on a Friday in general with COVID. So Christine is saying Las Vegas is still closed statewide until June 15th, but a new contract for staff, I'm assuming, is starting June 15th. So it looks like you're getting an order. So perhaps a more firm date than other dates that have passed. I know Christine Vegas was very much in the news, even in Canada, talking about, I mentioned a few sessions ago, obviously the mayor had one opinion about reopening and the unions had a different opinion. So that's been interesting to watch. I'm sure that same scenario exists in many states and many provinces and many urban areas where there's disagreement between industry and government. And there's no, I mean, there's no set path. So we just have to navigate I read a really great article that I will put out in my weekly newsletter to my clients. So if you're interested in getting that uh, newsletter, being signed up for the Pool Aid webinars does not get you on the newsletter list. I do not populate your personal information in that newsletter list without your consent. So if you'd like to get that newsletter this weekend, the one thing I was going to mention, I read a really, really great article yesterday talking about being comfortable in a holding pattern. So I, I really felt that this articulated what I've been feeling for my work, which is, you know, I want to clear the schedule for me and my work, I want to be available to respond. But I don't want to make false plans until I have some certainty that things are going in a direction. So perhaps in Alberta, for example, if May 14th, the province initiates phase one, great, pools are not in phase one, then perhaps June 2nd, they initiate phase two, pools are not in phase two, then I can anticipate if phase three is initiated, pools are after phase three. So then I have some certainty that for July, for August, I can start to get my ducks in a row. So yeah. If you're just coming in, let us know what's new, where you're at, what are you working on work-wise, what are you excited about for the weekend, or if you're just sitting there, you're tired, you're done. I'm having my coffee a bit later this morning. Uh, it's just been one of those days. I got up really early. I got the show notes from Monday done, which was awesome. I almost have the show notes for Wednesday done. Those of you who were here on Wednesday, we had a bit of a snafu with people's addresses in the chat box, so I have to edit that out. But the show notes for Wednesday are almost done. I'm getting caught up, which is great. So welcome, welcome, welcome. I see some new names. I see lots of uh, past names. So Jean is saying for Massachusetts, still on furlough with no word. Sometimes no information is, is helpful right? Even saying we don't have any information and we'll check back in two weeks on this date can be very helpful. Massachusetts, Jean, I know that it's been hit very hard. I spoke with a friend uh, from graduate school and she was telling me when I spoke to her two weeks ago, 40,000 cases in a state of 6 million. And, and it was very frustrating for her because she's, she's going to have a baby either this week or next week. She's very pregnant and stuck at home and just very frustrated that you know, the situation is what it is. It's very difficult. So welcome, Elizabeth from Northern Virginia. Paul is saying May 15th for maybe phase one to start in Nevada. Makes sense. Different situations in different locations. Katie Short is saying in Ottawa, Ontario, not sure if it's been mentioned, but Life Saving Society Ontario has extended all calls to three months past when things open. So that's a really nice policy. I know that the Life Saving Society of Ontario, they did a really great job. They did their online, excuse me, they did their annual general meeting online a few nights ago, which was great. And I think it makes complete sense to extend awards past opening. I know for me, my National Lifeguard Award comes up in November 
And that will be interesting because I will fall past award extension and I would certainly not expect an award extension, but then it will be on me to get in the pool ASAP in September because I'm a public customer. I don't work at too many facilities where I'm internal staff. I can't go and swim in startup or preseason. I'm going to have to wait until pools open and then I'm going to have to be at the pool as much as possible in September, October, because realistically, I last swam in February. That's a long time not to swim. So it's going to be challenging. Sherilyn in High River says that she's just finishing up health and safety protocols after six weeks of slowly working through them. Looking forward to some outside projects this weekend. I hear you need to get outside, whether you're into gardening, just walking around. I know you have some kids, Sherilyn, so you know, playing outside. The computer is so much for those of us in aquatics, not what we're accustomed to, being stuck at a desk. We're used to walk arounds, lessons, filling in chemicals, program supplies, talking to customers, like we're active and moving. And that I think for some people, myself included, has been a real downer to, to have to just be inside and sitting. Hello, Lori from Cornwall, Ontario. I haven't been to Cornwall in years, but it's not too, too far away from Ottawa. Katie is saying for Ottawa, they're also looking at doing more online courses to meet the needs of staff, positive to move forward, just bad why we have to move online. Understandable. I think this is a great push for a lot of industries, aquatics included, to have an online option. I was very impressed yesterday as a local business owner, a member of the Chamber of Commerce, I was invited to a phone call in the evening that was led by my member of parliament. So the Canadian federal government, my MP is like my congressman in the US. So my MP was running a committee and hosted a call with five provincial uh, members of the legislative assembly for Alberta, as well as economic development uh, people that worked on different crises in Alberta, such as the Fort McMurray fires, such as the high river flood. And so they were having a two hour information session for business owners in the foothills in southern Alberta. The tie in to your point, Cheryl Ann, is I was super impressed that a silver lining for me from this COVID pandemic is that I'm able to tune in to a call on my phone from my bed watching Netflix that's pertinent to me. And it's not a town hall that I have to go to the library and meet 100 other people, I can still get the information in live time, and that my MP and my MLAs have committed to providing that information to business owners is pretty amazing. So Cheryl's here from Duluth, Minnesota, still in a holding pattern with no public facing businesses opening on Monday, oh, excuse me, with non-public facing businesses opening on Monday, stay at home recommendations still in place. So that's another piece too, is if you have clear restrictions on what you can and can't do, very straightforward, it's going to become more difficult as we have fewer, fewer clear guidelines. If something's in a gray area, what I might choose to do might be different from what you might choose to do. Kat is here from Overland Park, Kansas. Kat, I definitely put your name on an envelope yesterday. I was doing stickers last night. Uh, my husband was watching Netflix. They just released what's the Ashton Kutcher, Colorado kind of show. So I got <laughs> my TV choices were completely trumped because he wanted to watch that. And I was doing uh, sticker envelopes last night. Hi, Noreen from Ottawa. Uh, Leah's here looking great. Thank you. Makeup, Leah would approve. Working in High River instead of uh, listening while I update and files. Not a favorite job for anyone, files. Uh, I know my computer right now is a hot mess. My desktop and my downloaded files are usually very organized and right now it's a little bit of everything. Hello to Elizabeth, Jessica from Chandler with a stay at home order till May 15th. I'm gonna do another update about the competition since we have some more people in the room. So we have a competition today. The Canadian Red Cross has kindly donated a free participation at the virtual Manitoba and Saskatchewan Aquatic Conference that's happening in two weeks. I will be presenting along with many other great panelists. The registration is free. You have the opportunity to win it anywhere in the world. It is hosted in Canada. It is geared towards Canadians, but they've said that they'll ship the swag and the registration to anybody who wins. So if you're interested in winning, the 
photograph on Instagram that you need to comment on is linked in the chat box. The secret question, please. So what I would like you to comment on is look at the program guide. I'm going to pin the program guide here. Have a look at the program guide and let us know or let me know in the comments which session you're most interested in seeing or presenter or which topic is most applicable to you. Please don't just say me. It's You're, you're not going to get any extra points for just saying me. There's many great presenters who are scheduled to talk. If you are interested in registering independently, the registration is only $70 Canadian, which is pretty amazing. They will have webinar recordings available and they have committed to sending out all the cool free swag from the Red Cross. They'll send it to your house. So usually they do, you know, keychains and notepads and band-aids and badges and all of that swag will come in a box to your house for $70 as well as two days worth of webinar sessions. They are using click meeting like I do, so you can attend them live or you can watch the recordings later. So lots of great options. I see Julie here from Perryville, Missouri. Let me scroll back up. Mary's here from New York City. Mary, we're thinking of you. New York is just, I can't even imagine what it's like in New York City. Sherry's here from Portland, Texas. Ashley's here from Farmers Branch. Melissa's here from Colorado. I see Jane from the JCC in West Hartford, Connecticut. Hi, Jane. Jane was asking last week about um, masks. So if anybody has any good online locations where they've been able to order masks that are not back ordered, pop that in the chat box. Brian from Hartford, Dana from Bonneville, Alberta, welcome. I see Megan from Peoria, Arizona. Cameron from Waukegan, Illinois, locked down in Illinois until the end of the month. So Cameron with that, I'm assuming May, still another four to five weeks. Colleen is here from Portland, Maine. So welcome everyone. I also in the chat box, you can scroll back and see I've posted the show notes for Monday. I finished those show notes. Let me go ahead and post the show notes for today. Jason Simitak will be starting in five minutes or so shortly after the hour. So hang out. We are doing a competition today. If you're interested in winning a free registration to the Manitoba Saskatchewan virtual conference, you can comment on the Instagram post that is in the uh, chat box. I'll mention it again right before Jason starts and at the end of the session today. I will keep it open about 30 minutes after the webinar. Please make sure you comment which session or topic or presenter from the conference you're most interested in hearing. And it's open to everyone. Damaris says, oh, thank you. Uh, so Damaris is mentioning I was nominated by somebody, probably from one of these webinars. So thank you to whomever nominated, for, nominated me for the Association of Aquatic Professionals uh, Competitor of the Month for the month of May. So I am the winner for the month of May. Thank you so much, you guys. It, uh, yeah, that's pretty amazing. I'm joining a, a very small group of elite people. So Damaris, uh, Kelly Martinez, Joey Rusnak from Lifeguard Authority, Willa Suter. So thank you everyone for that. I really appreciate it. That is up on the uh, Association of Aquatic Professionals website. I will put the link in the chat box a bit later when I'm not live before Jason starts, but if you're interested, it, I do have a little bio, a little bit more about me and how I started the webinars. I've also thought that I would start doing some small video logs and I'll put those on my YouTube channel. There have been some different topics that people have asked me to address that are not really 40 minute webinar sessions. So I just thought I would do some little sound bites and start uploading those on YouTube. I'm pretty active on Instagram, but Everybody has bloopers and I appreciate the ability to snip out little sections and leave it up longer on YouTube. So subscribe to our YouTube channel for all of these recordings from these webinars, as well as new content that I'll be posting as we go along in the next couple of weeks and the next couple of months. So thank you everyone. Christine, if you scroll back, I see Christine has mentioned the Waterman reusable mask. So that's been a hot topic in a lot of Facebook groups that I've been seeing this week. And I didn't know exactly what it was. So I appreciate you sharing that, Christine. I'm just scrolling back. I see Jennifer from Ohio. Uh, other names. I see 
Stephanie's here. Thank you, everyone. So we'll start in a minute or two. Last call I've got in the chat box just for pre-session. I've provided information in the chat box about the Manitoba and Saskatchewan Aquatic Conference. It is going virtual this year. It is two days, May 12th and 13th, two weeks from now. I will be presenting a session. There are other great presenters such as John Napier, Kevin Pace, Brenda Robinson, um, and Porteous. We're all going to be doing online sessions that can be attended live or you can watch the recordings. Registration is $70 Canadian and that includes swag that will be delivered to your door or there is a $35 no swag option if you're on a budget, if you have lost your job, you're laid off. It's open to anyone in the world. It is it is geared towards the Canadian Red Cross, which is quite different from the American Red Cross in programming and water safety. But if you want to do something different, I mean, 35 bucks Canadian is $20 American for two days worth of webinars and recordings is pretty amazing. So if you're interested in a free registration, we're having a competition today. I've put the Instagram link in the chat box. I will put it in one more time except I think I dropped it. I dropped it. So it is today's post on our Instagram profile. I would ask that the secret question that makes you eligible, so we're looking for which program um, item session presenter you are most interested in hearing. So have a look at the program guide that I have pinned in the show notes and the secret question that I would ask you to answer on the Instagram post to be eligible to win the free uh, a free conference participation for anyone in the world is just what session would you like to see or who would you like to hear? And no, there's no doubling up. If you say me, that's not gonna get you any extra chances. So uh, that's, that's the plan. So I'm gonna respect your time. I'm going to do uh, my brief introduction and then I will introduce Jason Simitek so he can get started. The show notes for today are here. Let me pin these in the chat box. It also has the information regarding the conference. So let me pin today's show notes and open it up in a different window. One moment. Okay. So welcome everyone. Today is Friday, May 1st. Uh, still here, still in COVID. Things are improving in some areas, not improving in others. Uh, we are quite a ways into these webinars. We're starting to near the end of what I think I can offer. There's so much different programming out there. So keep an eye on our Facebook page as we put up the last few sessions and we start to make announcements about other things that we'll be doing. My name is Katie Crysdell. I'm the owner of Lakeview Aquatic Consultants near Calgary, Alberta. Thank you for spending part of your Friday with us, either live or watching this webinar recording on YouTube. All of our sessions are posted for free on YouTube in posterity. There is no paywall. There is no financial ramification for me or any of the presenters. This is all our donated time for you to benefit you during this time of crisis and uncertainty. So I mentioned a little bit earlier Oh, Aaron's here. Aaron, we did a big shout out for our competition today. So I will give another shout out about the competition at the end of the session. If you're just joining us, you can scroll up in the chat box and see the post that you need to comment on, what you need to comment about, and you will be eligible to win one of the free vouchers for a conference registration that I mentioned. So I wanna briefly talk about Jason Simitek from Quantum Recreation. So I shared earlier in the pre-show, Jason and I worked a Calgary casino together a couple years ago for a nonprofit organization called the Alberta Recreation Parks Association. And nothing like spending 12 hours in a 50 square foot box with a bunch of people and a million dollars to really get to know them well. So Jason is a recreation consultant, and that's not a bad word. I know myself in aquatics, I've had bad experiences with consultants, but I'm now also a consultant. And I think he would agree that we wanna be the new generation of consultants and we wanna provide value to people. So he's gonna be really talking today about how you can make aquatics a winner in your community by really using whether survey strategies, communication to provide that compelling argument to your dry management, director, council, community, why does aquatics matter? 
we all know that, but they don't get it, right? If you're juggling fire versus the swimming pool, well, the fire is going to play better in the newspaper, so the pool may not get funding. Then the pool may not may be up against the library or you know new ramps for accessibility at the grocery store. So today, Jason's going to be talking basic strategies in a really fun way. Uh, if you saw on our Facebook page today, we shared his. I asked for a fun headshot, and he sent me a Baywatch uh, photoshopped photo, which was great. So Jason is really, really great, and I'm super thrilled that he's agreed to present today. So I'm going to pass it over to Jason. Uh, I'm just going to authorize your mic and camera, and I will pull up the presentation. We'll just give Jason a second to get, oh, I see you, perfect. So I'm gonna turn my camera off. And then so everybody, okay, fabulous. Okay, I'm gonna go away and you can start whenever you are ready. Fantastic, well, thanks Katie. And I guess, uh, you know, it's always fun trying new, new methods of actually communicating. I know one of the big things right now, there's so many different platforms out there. And I thought I was a, we use Ring Central, which is a Zoom-based platform. And then I've used Go meeting and all these different ones. And it's the first time ever using click meeting. So I'm glad we were able to get that fixed quite quickly. So thank you very much, Katie. So how's everyone doing? Um, good, I can't hear anything. That means everyone's microphone's muted, which is fantastic. That's why I'm here. So uh, first off, uh, do a couple safety things because that's how I like to start things. Um, make sure you identify your closest fire exits as the information in this presentation is gonna be hot. So make sure you uh, find that hot exit. You may need to use it. I also want to ensure that if you're comfortable as possible, if you need to leave for any reason, please feel free to excuse yourself. Don't worry about raising your hand or leaving or asking me. You can go ahead and use the washroom. Lastly, if you're thirsty, feel free to help yourself to anything in the fridge. I'm actually really upset. I used that joke uh, probably when this first started and then Ellen DeGeneres actually stole it from me eight days later. So uh, feel free, any of my jokes you're able to use, some are super painful and they will, uh, I won't get mad at you at all for that. So also during this presentation, I'm gonna use a bunch of examples. Um, some may be viewed as being less favorable. Um, but again, if I use your municipality, I do apologize. I just use it as a example. Um, I'll point out some ways to make it better. If you see maybe one of your neighboring municipalities or something along those lines that are being utilized, please make sure to let them know that we used it. And if you have any concerns with it, um, you can always email me and, and have that thing. So I'm gonna start off by saying that I'm actually not a pool person, um, but if I can make this work. So yeah, so I'm actually not a pool person at all. Um, I've never actually, I don't know how, what chlorine, chlorination to use or you know how to make a pool hot or colder, those type of things, or why when I go in the pool, for some reason, the water always turns purple around me. But one thing I am, I have experienced quite a bit of pools. So I have, you know, grown my hair out, done the crazy little hair thing. I've been in swam in the ocean, done some scuba diving. Again, some more fun-filled scuba diving. And yeah, I did, unfortunately, Katie took my, my joke away. I did do a little bit of Baywatch once upon a time. I know right now you're laughing and it's pretty embarrassing. This photo, I should have done more push-ups before I got, um, before I took the photo and put it up there. So, but yeah. So again, so who, who am I? Who is this, who's this guy standing in front of you? Um, so my name is Jason Simtuck. I'm a Parks and Recreation Planner. Um, what that actually means is I do a lot of planning work. So my job is to help municipalities decide where parks go, what kind of recreation is required. We do some audits as well to figure out needs um, and also looking at the actual structure of programming and service delivery. So I can, or I have come in and helped out Aquatics to figure out, you know, where they may be able to spend money a little bit better, how they can maybe make some more money using the words like businessification, which sometimes people view that as a very negative thing. So I represent uh, a boutique firm called Quantum Recreation. There's about three of us that work together. And again, we do anything from needs assessments, facility assessments, park recreation, trail planning are kind of our, our sort of segment that we work. We do a lot of work also with the population size of about under 50,000. Um, so who am I actually? So my career started when I was super young, many, many years ago when I was 11. Um, I was a volunteer actually doing swim and fun camps, doing more of the program delivery side on the recreation piece. 
from there, I went up and we started with volunteer, junior leader at 14, leader at 16, programmer at 18, and then I did some special projects for a municipality under the community development role. Then I went on to a larger municipality, or sorry, a smaller municipality uh, in a community development coordinator role for parks. And that's kind of where I got some of my bigger planning stuff organized and understanding of how municipalities actually worked. Then uh, I left in 2012 and started quantum recreation on my own. Um, so during the, the earliest times of my recreation career, I actually, sorry, um, during my early times of recreation career, I actually worked for a very large municipality here up in Alberta, Canada. So just before you get too crazy and want to ask too many questions regarding this, yes, the, uh, this is actually how we travel in Canada up north here is that we don't, we don't use cars. We basically have dogs that around. We do live in igloos, so make sure you know that. But again, when I started learning, this is how um, we started talking about stats when I started with this larger municipality in Alberta. Um, because again, and why they are important, because there's things like this that end up occurring. Who's ever seen these before? These are basic org charts. Org charts are how we run our municipalities and how we structure our, our municipalities and how power and also funding ends up transferring through. So there's two different types of common ones you'll find. You may have a different uh, based in your municipality or how you run. I know there's a bunch of Americans here. You may run a private one that may not be under a municipality. Again, this is how municipalities work. Uh, so very two very common ones. Two, one has um, advantages and disadvantages. So if you look at this one. So this one's a unique one because it actually has, if you notice, a community services piece to it. So normally when it's happening, municipality comes from your, from your city manager, county manager, CAO, and it breaks down into each of these to certain silos. So one of the big things that in this one you'll see is that you see the county sort of community services in there. You also see enforcement services and fires within the same strain of the silo created by the org chart. Why this is important is because if you have a manager that is strong, they can help the interim fighting that's happening between the three of you. And what ends up happening is you don't have the ability to actually chat with council and try and bring some of your things forward. So for example, if you're in community services, which normally aquatics falls under, recreation parks falls under, what ends up occurring is that you have the ability to um, not have your issues come to light when it comes to aquatics, because you're fighting and sort of negotiating that sort of budget line in between the two other larger people of enforcement service, which is your bylaw, police, and then your fire as well, that uh, you end up figuring out where funding is gonna be going and coming. The other sort of one you see common is this type of one where you have the, again, CAO, city manager, county manager, and then breaking down. And what ends up happening, they actually break off the culture recreation piece and protective services. This gives you a better advantage when you're actually doing any sort of request for funding or trying to figure out what you're going to do because you can actually go in front of council and actually have that debate better. And then what happens is they're looking at trying to treat every department fairly you have that sort of fair shake as opposed to the previous slide where you're grouped into one and you have one person fighting for you for dollars as opposed to looking at this structure where you actually have all of it. So again, so that's kind of the differences of it. Why that's important again is that ability to talk to council to try and get funding um, or public to try and understand how that ends up working when you're working with councils or elected officials. So the biggest thing through this presentation, I'm going to go through and I'm going to define some things for you to try and make some sense when it comes to survey data and working with surveys. So you have quantitative data and qualitative data. Quantitative data is the things that can be counted really easy where you can attribute numbers to it. So for example, you saved five people. Qualitative data is that descriptive and conceptual piece. So how those people felt. It's more open-ended. It's this more of the softer side of things you end up doing right, is what the qualitative piece is going to be. So why is that important? So when we start looking at things, um, basically when we start looking at different uh, ways you can spin sort of the, uh, the survey data that is coming out. So if you're looking at this in 2020, fire service extinguished 22 structural fires and saved 11 lives and saved 92 million in property damages. That sounds pretty impressive because there is an actual way to actually explain that fire is able to do this. So if you can, quantitate that and say, you know, if we had an extra million dollars, we could potentially end up bringing down the property value or property damage, save a couple more people and maybe extinguish a little bit more fires. 
when you look at the, so, and the other neat thing is they actually combine both qualitative and quantitative data, data sets. When we look at aquatics or recreation for that matter, we produce stats like this. In 2020, aquatics taught 1,200 children how to swim and they had fun. One thing that I find that's very interesting when we start looking at surveys from other municipalities is we start seeing that we love using easy surveys that only have circles on it and smiley faces and we can say that, you know, did you have a good time at this program? Did you have fun? Well, when you're, when you're talking about the differences between fire, who can say that they saved lives and they were able to actually reduce the amount of property damage versus aquatics or recreation says we had a bunch of children, they had a really great time. It makes it really difficult to, for you as aquatics and recreation to actually state that you have a case and a good fight in this. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today is trying to explain how surveys actually come out. One of the key things that also that's going on right now with I know a lot of my clients is that they're having some concerns right now that because of the shutdown, a lot of the municipalities are worried about dollars and cents. They've actually amalgamated all budgets and redistributed them halfway through the year. Normally budgets are on a yearly time cycle. I'm assuming that's the same in the States as well. And what ends up happening is that that money is allocated for the year. Well, what's happened now because of COVID actually, all the money's come up and it's gone to essential services. And then whatever's left over is being dropped back to aquatics and recreation and non-essential services. So that poses a very interesting thing for municipalities to try and figure out what they're going to be doing. So again, the, the kind of stats that we end up bringing out for recreation and aquatics and parks are things like this. You know, we had 1,200 children. The other thing, parks, we can state that we had 2,200 visitors. It's difficult for us to actually quantitate that and actually make it make sense to say why that's good and why that's a really good value for people. So you look at these three examples right here, the aquatics one. So in 2020, aquatics taught 1,200 children to swim and they had fun. Parks did, you know, had 2,200 visits. And then you look at fire of the fire service extinguished 22 structural fires and saved 11 lives and prevented 92 million in property damages. One of the great things that you end up finding is that if you had a million dollars, council would be giving it to this. Also, who has the better news story of this? Is it going to be fire services or is it going to be aquatics and parks? Unfortunately, it's going to be fire services coming out of it. So one of the big things that, that you need to remember is that you need to engage with the public because you have a, a hard time trying to get stats and trying to create things that can tell good stories. So for example, fire has that ability to say they did 22 structural fighters and saved 11 lives. For you to actually gain that, that quantitative piece of why it's important to be in aquatics, you need to do things like surveys or engage with your public or your members or your customers. One of the reasons we do surveys when it comes to recreation and parks and pools as well is because it's something that we can do fast and it's also an easy way to get some data. But the issue we have is we have these amazing surveys that are produced by people like this. So not only is this survey been created, um, but it's extremely confusing if you look at it. So it states things like, you know, under question one, if you answered yes, this one, they go to question two. If you said no, go to question three. So first off, as me as a user, I'm already confused and I don't want to do it. I'm trying to figure out what this survey is for. I kind of figured that it's for, you know, the Activate Swimming Club, which I understand that. But if I have this survey in my hand, why would you be asking me if, it's, if I'm a part of it or not? Either you can create two surveys out of this would make a lot more sense. Because if I'm not part of it, then I'd actually have a whole stream of questions that would be there that would be actually more beneficial to you as the provider and municipality. And if I'm yes, then it'd be totally different answers too. Because it doesn't matter if I'm a member and I've been a member for two or three or five years. Because you can ask me different questions based upon that and get some actual good results out of it. So the other thing with a survey like this, it, because it's confusing, it also wastes people time, which means if you give this to someone on when they're quickly leaving, they're going to give you garbage back out on it. Because the thing is, they're looking at this, they just want to, you're staring at them and you're going to fill out the survey. Because you're staring at them, they're going to quickly fill it out and give it back to you really quick. But then it's going to give you not very good data on the end of it. Then the other type of survey you're having is something like this. It looks really good. Um, however, what ends up happening is that you have an issue trying to translate these types of, of 
data that comes out of this. So for example, I took two questions out, or sorry, three questions out of the survey to make some sense of it. So the question is, which aquatic programs do you currently participate in? Check all that apply. So if I'm a learn to swim, if I'm a swim team, if I, whatever I do, I check them all. Now, the next question, three questions later, is gonna be, please rate your experience with the Recreation Parks Aquatic coaches and staff. So the issue that comes with this, if I have, I'm part of the swim team and I also do scuba diving, how do I actually rate you and tell you the issues I have with the parks and coaches and staff? Because there's no way for me to change it. So I'm now stuck as a user, giving you pretty much garbage data because you can't utilize it for anything. Or the other example, you know, if I did adaptive and my child did learn to swim classes and I get this one survey, does that mean now I'm making two surveys as the user? And now I'm confusing anymore because now you have more data input and it doesn't help you out very much when you get that sort of information. So what can you actually do about this? Don't worry. So what can you actually do about this? So there's a couple things, so don't worry. I'm back again, the survey. Uh, my lifeguarding is here now to help you out. So what you need to do is that every good survey needs a couple things. You need to worry about planning it, you need to worry about designing it, and you need to worry about reporting. Are the key things that you're looking at when you're doing a survey? So when you're looking at the plan, the key things you need to think about is who's gonna be taking the survey, how many surveys do you want to get back? How are you gonna execute the survey? How long do you want to be inputting data for, which is a really good one to think about. Um, I'll go on a, a little story on this one. I was working with another consulting partner on a larger uh, recreation master plan, and what ended up happening is that I was trying to make a lot of closed-ended questions, so the idea where you put check marks in. However, my consulting partner at the time wanted to get you know really quality of data they want to really get you know to the heart of things so we did a lot of open-ended questions we ended up getting 220 surveys back and had 22 questions that were open-ended it took us over 85 hours to input all the data and then that, that was just inputting and then we actually had to try and transcribe that data and actually analyze it all in we budgeted for a 20-hour project that probably took us about 160 hours to actually input just the data. So we burn most of the budget just on this, this inputting process. So remember when you're looking at this, how long you wanna be inputting data for. What the data will be used for. Would you like to use these type of words? Would you like to use citizen when you're describing the data? Or would you like to use users or respondents? And we'll get to that next to what that is and what that actually means for people. Then the, the last thing is, what is your post-program survey? You should always have something to compare a beginning survey to an end if it's a program. Or the other option too, is what are you gonna ask in you know, three months time? Because again, surveys and the data you build can tell a story. And the idea here is when you're in your planning session, trying to figure out what you're trying to tell and what kind of story you're trying to get out of this. So we talked about two different terms that we were chatting about. One, or sorry, three different terms we were chatting about. One is called using the word citizens, users, or a population. So one thing to use the word citizens or the population, you need to do something called simple random sample. Basically what that is, is where you have uh, it's to use, so when you do citizen surveys, so when you can say, you know, 8% of the population loves blue chairs. To do that, you need to actually follow a certain mathematical stream to do that. So to get that done, it's a very confusing statistical thing. If anyone did stats back in the day, this is what it looks like, however, if you're really bound and determined of actually using words like citizens um, and trying to calculate a whole entire population of your community, you can do this or you can go online um, and use SurveyMonkey to figure that out. So what this means, it helps you try and figure out what you're trying to tell a story about and gives you some credibility on it. So what that does, it gives you, you put in your sample population size, your confidence level, which tells you that you're that confident of what you're trying to say. So for example, if you have, if your population is 200, you're gonna say with confidence, with 95%, they're gonna say that the answer you provide is correct. Then that, that's what you end up viewing. And then the margin error is the plus or minus that ends up occurring from it. So there's different ways. If you look at this little sample right here of changing things. So for example, 200 population size on both of these, 95% confidence value, then your sample size changes quite a bit based on your margin of error. And that margin of error is only important when you're doing things like this. 
So I'm going to use polling numbers. I know we're not getting into the politics of it, but these are something that's always interesting. I like to educate people on and explain what the margin of error is and why it's important when you're doing statistics or doing any type of surveys. So for example, you're saying something's better than something else and there's a plus or minus on it um, and a margin of error. That's what the plus and minus is. So that little section there, it says plus or minus three and a half percent. Why that's important? Because when you originally look at this, it looks like, wow, you know, in these states, blue is really winning everywhere. However, if you look at some of the closer states, like the one that says Trump versus O'Rourke, and you look at 49 to 51, it looks like O'Rourke's going to win. However, when you look at the actual plus or minus there at 3.5%, that means that O'Rourke could actually be at 51 minus 4. We'll make it easy, so that makes it 47, which means he would actually lose against Trump. Or you can say that Trump is actually above, so you add 4 to 49, and that still ends up winning. So when you look at some of these things that come through the paper and you see these like interesting polling data and things like that, where it says, you know, 58% of the population wants X, always look at that margin of error to help actually explain this, to actually help you understand what's actually going on. So moving on from that, let's beat up the survey again, because I'm going to, this is going to be the one I'm going to probably beat up quite a bit now. And one of the interesting things on this is looking at this, we're trying to figure out what exactly they're, they're trying to ask here. So looking at that, uh, we can try and figure out, you know, they're trying to see if there's, that people want to be a member of some sort of club, and if they, they currently are a member, how many years are there, you know, if they're interested in being a member, um, give them the email address, you know, and then they ask this random question of how do you rate the following, which are gym, pool, and cafe, and then do you have any comments you want to make? So some of the key things here, why this is not the best and greatest survey again, is that it can be split into two surveys. If I take a survey and I'm currently not part of the activation club, you can ask that right away if I'm going to grab it and just say, would you like to give your email to join it? The other thing too is that then it answers two of the, sorry, answers three of the six questions that are there right there, just basically on asking them to give an email to join the club. So then you now have the ability using this one page to add more information to actually give you the ability to ask actual quality and great questions. So looking at the survey and using what we chatted about earlier, so we understand that this, this survey is about planning for swing club programs. So when we go back to the original slide and the questions that were on there, who is your audience? So I'm assuming a swimming club based on this, we're going we're to assume it's going to be teens. So the audience here is going to be teens. Your language will have to meet teens language. How many surveys do you want? So let's say 50. So based on 50 surveys, what you end up deciding on that is you can do it online or you can do it by paper with only 50 surveys. If you're looking for 300 surveys, paper handout surveys may not be the best. So again, how are you going to execute this? Paper is an option you end up having. How long do you want to be inputting data for? So based on 50, I know how when I worked in municipality, I didn't have the most amount of time in the world to actually be doing data entry all the day. So I want to do it short. So lots of multiple choice the way you make it short because you can quantify that data quite quickly as opposed to doing long, which is open-ended and verbatim questions. Because then you have to go through and you have to actually fit those verbatim questions into actual usable piece of data. Because no one wants to read 50 people telling you how great the swimming club is or why they want to join it. You got to figure out what will the data be used for. So we're going to use it for program planning and potentially looking for funding as well. So would you like to use citizen? or users or respondents. So we're going to use respondents. Why that's important, again, we don't have to do an SRS for it. The cool thing now is that when the surveys come in, if we only get 25 surveys, we can say of the 25 respondents, those 25 people would like to do X, as opposed to saying the community wants to do X. So that's one of the things. The other neat thing you can do with this too is you can actually look at your users within your pool. So you could survey a bunch of people at the pool, all your users there, and get some survey data back and say the users of the pool provide this. And that's the neat thing that comes out of the difference between the SRS or actually using respondents or users. So next up, one of the big things you're going to do after the planning phase is you're going to be designing. So one thing that I always like to do when I'm doing any sort of survey work or any community engagement perk is always thinking about what kind of story I want to tell. So of that, I always like to start at the ending. So looking at the actual survey, what, what, what am I going to do with this data? Why is this data important to me or to the people that are doing it? The other issue is, what are some of the hot topics happening right now? I know looking at, you know, in Canada here, some of the hot topics that we, we have going on is things like childhood obesity, isolated seniors, mental health, 
Um, we have a bunch of other things. You can actually put that into your survey to use that data and either use it with the idea of matching it to actual province or statewide data, or you can also use it to try and get additional funding. So for example, if one of the hot topics is new immigrants, then you can say, you know, this program is going to serve new immigrants. These are all great things that comes out of it. And there's going to be funding that comes out for new immigrants. Or you can also help out hot topics with using your corporate strategic plan coming for your council and your administration. So for example, if one thing is to be one of the key pillars that a lot of people are talking about is environment. So you can actually ask some of those questions that actually feed in. So then when you're looking for funding, either from your council or a grant for that matter, you can match the stats you get to actually go towards getting the information, getting the dollars from it. This is a big thing coming out of design that I always like to do is always test it. So for example, give it to a colleague. If it's for youth, maybe give it to a kid. Do a couple of tests of it. The other key thing that comes out of testing is if you have some open-ended questions, so for example, feeling questions, or you know, what, what would you like to learn out of this? You can start getting some of those actual multiple choice in there by testing it. And then that would actually speed up some of your data recall and your data entry that comes out of it. Because again, you don't want to be like me spending over 160 hours inputting data and trying to analyze it when you only had 20 hours to do it. So I like to always look at this quote um, that kind of helps out a little bit. That often statistics are used as drunk, drunken persons use lampposts. They use them for support rather than illumination. One thing when you're going into any sort of stats or any sort of survey, you're not trying to find out new information. You're trying to find support for something. And that's one of the things why when you look at designing, you're trying to tell a story, trying to figure out what you want to tell. And then again, the data you get from the statistics is going to actually support it rather than tell a new story. That's never the goal of this. So one thing to always remember that you're always trying to tell a story while making those questions. And always think of this, that again, it's used just like drunk people. They kind of wander around, they hold on lampposts, they go to the next one, and they're actually not trying to get home using light, using lampposts to try and help hold themselves up. So what kind of story would you like to tell? So with a swimming club program, you know, we want to talk about how great youth are. You know, what are some of the hot topics right now? I know right now in, in Alberta, another big thing is the after school time period is an issue for youth. So that time right after school till parents get home is kind of when the youth kind of get in some trouble and they, they're looking for ways to program them. The other thing is youth unemployment right now. And also one thing that we find in some of our amazing uh, pools up here is succession planning especially in smaller towns, they're having a hard time trying to find lifeguards to go through. So that's kind of the, the, the kind of hot topics that we're going to utilize for this survey that we're going to be talking about. So again, looking at the survey, this survey that we have in front of us isn't going to actually help us out at all. It's not going to give us anything because the data that, and the questions we ask is going to be garbage in equals garbage out. So right now we want some funding and participants for the survey. Or sorry, so we want participants for the, the Activate Swim Club. So the question that they asked inside theirs was, how many years have you been swimming? So if we want to say that's a, if we want to know the same thing, we can ask it to be a multiple choice. We want to know what would you like to gain from joining? So check, that's a check all that comply with an open-ended last question. So what time of day would you like to attend the swim club? So this is going to give us the ability to figure out what time is the best time to actually organize this swim club time. And it's going to be a check of all, all that apply. What day of the week is best for you? Again, that's going to be checked for all that apply. And provide an email address to become a member of the Activate Swim Club. And then why do you want to join the Activate Swim Club? And that will be an open-ended. So what I'm trying to say here is like how you can actually position your questions and how you're going to ask them properly. So you save as much time as possible. So if you look at this, the two that I want to break out of that is going to be, what would you like to gain from joining? So of this, we can create some of our own sort of answers based on the story we want to tell that provide an easy access and, and an ability for you to data entry that into, the, into the, the survey quite quickly. The other thing we want to do is that we want, why would you want to join the Activate Swim Club? We want to leave that as open-ended. And the reason why is that we can get some good verbatim information out of that. And that verbatim information can help tell additional stories and so again, support the cause that we're looking for. So what we do is we played with the survey and actually rewrote it. So again, the first question was, how many years have you been doing? Next one is, how would you like to gain 
or what would you like to gain from joining? What time of day would work best for you to attend the swim club? What day of the week is best for you? Then provide your email address. And then also that last open-ended question of why would you want to join the Activate Swim Club? So if you look at this both on both sides, on the customer side and also your side, the customer can quickly go through this, takes less than a minute and a half, and the data you're going to get out of this can be really good. The other thing too, for you to enter it, if it's not online, it will take you literally a minute and a half to also enter it because it's super fast to actually enter. It's because your time is very important. The last thing you want to look at when you're trying to do a survey is try and figure out how you're going to report it. So how are you going to tell that story from the information you just grabbed? So there are certain ways you can do it. You can talk about infographics, which we'll talk about in a second. You can talk about written reports. And you can also do budget presentations and grant funding applications. So with that, again, making those pieces you pull the data to make really good sort of nails to actually provide information for you to get that, that dollars and show importance to what you're trying to do. So what is an infographic? An infographic is basically that. It's an information graphic. It's to represent information in a graphical format that makes it easy for a user to understand how and what you're trying to explain. So for example, I use two swimming ones here, one from the American Red Cross and one from Slim Jim. So if you look here, I can quickly notice and understand that you know, for one in, five, one in five households with children three to 17, none of the children can swim. So, and you look at that, it makes some sense. You have one little, little person that's floating and you have four that are swimming. So based on that, that one person obviously can't swim. So we understand quite quickly. And that's a very powerful stat for people to register and understand. If you look at like even the almost half, again, it shows a person uh, and you get really eye caught to the idea of almost half. So again, infographics are ways for you to present your data in a way that makes sense and makes it really easy for people to understand as opposed to giving them just the survey and some bunch of tables on, on a chart. So let's go back to the survey that we just designed. So again, looking at it, you have the ability to actually go through this really quickly, it takes two minutes, um, and the data you're getting is going quite good. So we actually use a, a program called SurveyMonkey is what we use in-house. I know there's Survey Gizmo, and there's all these other different online platforms. A lot of them are free. Um, also, you can use um, Google Sheets to do something like this as well. Um, we just use SurveyMonkey because it's super fast and things like that. So what we do is we can put the data in, and I played around with it uh, this week to give you some fake data here. But from the first question, we were able to get how many years have you been swimming, get a good graphical piece here that we also know that most people, without even looking at the percentages, are less have less swimming than, than older people, or sorry, less swimming experience than others. For the next question, we know that you know the big the main sort of what they would like to gain from this is to be a better swimmer and life saving skills. And the other thing is the other, um, and I sort of put what the other was there for the verbatim one person answer it's based out of three, and it gained friends. So even if this, if you look at the the numbers we have here, let's say we had you know thirty people answer as opposed to three. Again, those percentages are still there, but you can actually pull some really good data out of this. Next thing, what time of day would you like your swim club? Um, again, you had three people. It looks like that's the best time to do it. Really quick to understand that. What day is the best that works for you? Monday, Tuesday. This one, I should have found out better, but I didn't. But however, it tells you right now some actual good data out of this, that you can either, A, if you had enough people, so if you had 30 people answer, um, and your program can only hold 10, that means potentially you can hold three different sessions to use all three of those people, or it tells you that this is confusing and, and you're going to lose some people on it. The last one is how, you know, why would you want to join it? So again, this is your verbatim piece. You're always going to get really weird ones like this one. I like turtles. Um, I've had some really interesting verbatims where people are yelling at the city or yelling at their neighbor through these. I've had people tell me that, you know, that they hate this color of a bench. Um, I had people tell me they, they like turtles because they had the ability to say it. Um, even if they do things like this and you have that, you should always record it in your verbatims if you're doing any reporting. A lot of people will do this to catch you to make sure that their survey's heard. So if I can give you a piece of advice right now when you're doing verbatims and you're writing them out, make sure you write these little silly ones out like, I like turtles, because that person wants to feel that they've been heard and they can really quick go at the back and see for verbatims. And if their verbatim's there, they know their, their stat was there and they were happy at that point. The other neat thing that you end up getting is, uh, I'm new to the city and I really want to meet new people and I and get a job working for the pool. The last one, I think it would be fun. So again, we get some really good pieces. That middle one is probably the key one that's really important. Now this one, and it keeps on going. 
So again, what does this, this data mean that we got out of this? So out of that simple survey that literally took two minutes, what we're able to pull out of it is some really great stories out of this. So these are sort of the five that I could pull out really quickly. Um, and these are the type of things you need to start thinking about. Again, when you set up your survey, what kind of story do you want to tell? Oh, this, we can say two out of three participants want to be a lifesaver. Two out of three want to improve their swimming skills to become lifesavers. One out of three want job skills and work at the pool. Providing healthy lifestyle options for one third of the program respondents. And lastly, and you can reduce social isolation by one third of respondents by running this program. So when we first started this, you had a program that from a survey that was asking the same type of questions of trying to run a program getting organized. What came out of it is really great pieces of information and a story you could tell. So how this actually backed up by data. So the first question, you know, two out of three participants want to be a lifesaver. So what we do is we look at this and say, okay, we know lifesaver, we have 66%, which is two out of three. We can comfortably say that. If anyone wants to challenge you, say, hey, look, this is what it means. This is why this is important. So we can get some more funding based on fire because not only are you lifesavers, so are we. You know, two out of three want to improve their swimming skills to become lifesavers. Same idea again, you can use the lifesaving piece um, and state that against fire or other people that now you're actually training lifesavers. Now, the great thing with this one too, if you ever have the ability of having this data held somewhere um, and then all of a sudden you find out that one of your students actually has saved a life, you have that ability to pull this up and be like, look, we can, two of these three participants, who was Johnny, that was able to give CPR on the roadside, that is the most powerful story that you can tell that would actually help you get funding and also create a great need for life-saving the community. So one out of three want job skills and want to work at the pool. So again, you look at this, job skills, 33%, that's one out of three. Um, and also the neat thing too, is you can use that piece with a verbatim that says that I'm new this, that I really want to meet people and get a job working for the pool. So what that means is not only do you have a person that wants job skills that could be somewhere else, but you can also say that they don't only want job skills, they want to work at the pool, which helps your succession planning. Providing healthy lifestyles, again, out of the, the, the three fake people we had, one person chose that. But again, you can relate that to looking at national st stats or provincial or state stats, and you can actually draw a line between the two to get funding from healthcare if there's a health grant that's out there to provide healthy lifestyles. Well, you can say the kids in this program can do it. Um, also, you can reduce social isolation by one third. So you look at this because the other piece, you had one person say they want to make friends out of it. You also got all the verbatim that someone wants to make friends. So based on running this program, you now can say that this random swimming program can help reduce socialization by one third, which is really powerful data that no one can actually dispute you on that. So again, again, looking at the statistics, Always think about it as, as a drunken person, how they use lampposts, that again, you're looking for support, not actually trying to get a new point across. The last part of, of the survey sort of program is that post-program surveys. A lot of people forget about this piece. One of the main reasons why you want to do it is to have the same survey being asked at the beginning of a program to the end, or you do a quarterly survey that's the same, because then you can see how trends form and understand things. So you can gather growth data, so you can see if people are doing a program a lot more than they were before. You can also see if you met goals for the program that you set, because I know we all set goals when we do these programmings. And also gives you the ability to market your next program. So at the end of your survey, you have a little thing saying, make sure to join July's great swimming program because it's coming, or join our Instagram, or do whatever you need to to get X, Y, Z. Again, you have that ability with that piece of paper in front of them to actually market themselves and figure stuff out. So some of the key points that I'll leave you with today um, is remembering surveys are important tools for telling stories. Stories are what sells. If you've noticed what's happened with both our prime minister and your president, a lot of the times when they were doing their COVID-19, they were talking about people. They're talking about Jill, the, the, the stylist. What that does, it provides the ability to make you, council, public, other people that are trying to be your funders, understand and relate to it because they can tell that Johnny is learning how life save and he can save his grandma one day. Those are important things you can tell and that comes out of survey or someone that's gonna be a new Canadian or new American and they're gonna make friends and become less socially isolated and all the things that come from that. So remember your surveys are important tools for telling stories. Make sure each question counts. Don't waste people's time like the first survey I showed that, you know, 
you asked six questions. Out of that, you weren't going to be able to use any of that data anyways other than email address. The second one that came through where it was confusing, where you know you could you could do five different programs, but then you can only rate one coach, but one of the five could be amazing, all the rest could be garbage. It, it doesn't give you any good data. Remember when we start at the ending, figure out what the story you want to tell, and then make your survey support that. And lastly, the biggest one, I, we do a horrible job of this in recreation, parks, and aquatics. We don't tell our story well enough. So again, making some of these surveys come out, even doing a quick infographic, um, there's a lot of great programs out there, Cava, uh, PictoChart, that are free, that you can do really quick um, pieces to, sorry, quick uh, infographics to get that done. Tell your story, set it up, even put posters around your, your aquatics or give it to your council uh, or your great funders to figure out what's going on. Those are kind of the key things that, that we want to go through today or that I want to make sure you, you understand and use again. So again, I'm Jason Simtuk. Um, I'm a Parks Recreation Planner with Quantum Recreation. Uh, there's my contact information. If you require or need help with your surveys or want us to do a quick little readover of maybe some of the stuff you have that's going out, um, it's something that we'll be more than happy to help out with. Um, let us know if there's anything we can help you out with. So thank you for attending and thanks, Katie. Yeah, thanks, Jason. I want to have a discussion and kind of wrap some points together, but can everyone hear me? Can you let me know in the chat box? Can you hear me? Somebody? I can. Perfect. I can hear you. Okay, because it's spiraling for me, so I just want to make sure. So I just want to wrap some different things together. I know some people are not always understanding when I pick these different sessions, I'm curating what I think is information that people need. And I probably did a bad job introducing why I asked Jason to be here. And so I really want to highlight that we need the data to prove the concept. So Jason's talked about surveys. And if you're sitting there going, well, I do a survey about program satisfaction, as he said, why, why do I need more data? And I think, Jason, if you can speak a little bit to this, what are some situations that you've seen recently that people have solicited data? Like they've just decided, you know what, we're just going to do a survey. We need data because we know this is true, but nobody believes us. So one of the great things that we do um, is a lot of needs assessments. So one thing we walk in a community is there's a lot of people, again, from the Canadian side that will go to council. Uh, there'll be a group of 10 people that say, do you know what we need an arena? And what ends up happening is they come to council and say, you know, our hockey team needs an arena. Well, what surveys do and the data that comes out of it is that we can provide the difference between a need and a want. And again, it's only going to be one piece to create that want. But the thing is that it's going to help actually identify that need that's there um, and identify why that want's required. So the survey will ask things like, you know, how many do you right now, do you free skate? Would you like to free skate? Things like that to allow the opportunity that the public can do it. The other big thing that we use survey data for, um, especially when it comes to Miss Pallies, is figuring out how what people's expectations are. And I think this is one thing that we've done a really good job of in every survey we do is figure out what a person's expectation is based on the taxes they pay. So, for example, we don't just ask questions of, you know, if this program was to raise by five dollars, you know, is that okay? No, it's what do you expect if we raise it by five dollars? Do you expect that, you know, there'll be double the programming, whatever else? But the thing is, they can understand that $5, what do they actually get for their money, is really powerful when you work at survey data, for sure. Yeah, and I, I would be curious to know, just off the cuff, do you find that when people do surveys, does it typically prove or disprove the request? Because I've definitely experienced those. We want a water slide. Well, we actually need more pool space before we need a water slide. Again, surveys won't... The goal of the survey, like, it, I'm going to use my drunken one again, is not to actually... Uh, basically illuminate and create something new, it's basically to try and support it. So for example, if the goal is trying to get a water slide, is one way you get your survey done, but again, when it looks at dollars and funding, there's other things that you look at to make those metrics go. Just because you have 100 people coming in and say they want a brand new hot water, or sorry, a brand new hot tub, you're not going to invest the, the $100,000 just because 10 people want it. Or for example, if you know people think your pool is too cold, you as your aquatics manager will know what the costs are associated with that. But you can use that first request to say, hey, if we were to raise, you know, buy a dollar for your pool fees, what do you expect? Do you want a hotter pool? Then that gives you the ability to go to councils or whoever your funding model and say, hey, these people are willing to pay an extra dollar for a hotter pool. Let's do this. 
So I want to talk a little bit about nuts and bolts and then I want to talk COVID in surveys because I think that's an application that a lot of people who are still here, they really need to be considering how this is going to guide what they do and that they shouldn't be decision making without surveys. But can you talk nuts and bolts briefly? So let's say I run a pool, I'm already tired and stressed and busy. You know, I put together a survey on SurveyMonkey, I post it on our Facebook page. Do I leave it for two weeks? How long do I do it? Do I try and get more people to fill it out or I want fewer people so it's more honest responses? What are some basic tips? Okay, so number one, uh, SurveyMonkey, if you're looking for the honesty of it, uh, try and send it out through emails and then get the unique identifier so that you don't have someone that fills out 100 of the same thing. <laughs> That's my first yeah. thing on that. Um, but no, you're looking for basically a two week turnaround time and make sure you send out reminders um, every three days um, using a program like SurveyMonkey or, or Survey Gizmo, those ones, they have that ability to keep emailing through their actual site. So as they fill out the survey, they won't get reminders is another key thing that, that we can, or that we do that's really good. So I know right now it, it's gonna be difficult because the interesting thing that's gonna happen right now we're using COVID and any recreation or aquatics or those type of things is that what's gonna happen is that the floodgates are gonna open. And one thing that with my role with ARPA, so I sit on the board for the province for recreation and parks, is the flooding gets going to open and what's going to happen is you're going to have this cost cutting that's going to be occurring to try and get as much market share as going to be there. Us as municipal providers or that you are subsidized by tax base, you need to make sure that you're doing things properly. So again, maybe waiting a little bit other than pools, because again, there may not be that many private pools in your area. I know in Canada, it's a little bit different. The states may be different. But when you're looking at any of those, those fringe things like fitness programs or those types, you need to make sure that you're going to be doing it properly and make sure you're surveying the people that are currently in your program before to try and bring them back to ensure that they're going to get the best use out of things. So again, and this is the neat thing is now you can start asking questions like, you know, what's the best time to have a adult swim program or a kid's program or these type of pieces, because you're starting at ground zero as opposed to before where, you know, you, you had this program, you had to shift people, you might get some people angry at you. Well, now you have the ability to, to restart everything, which is fantastic. Yeah, the life first. <laughs> Um, do you think it's appropriate to start doing like, I think you, I think you're going to say yes, but it's appropriate to start doing surveys now that we're in COVID. Do we want to ask those questions or is it going to add to our workload in a way that's not helpful? So I'm going to be, I'm going to be a loser. Cause I, I like stats. I like data. Um, so for me, I want, I would suggest you start doing now because again, what you're going to be able to do when these floodgates open, yes, right now you're looking at trying to make sure your sanitation is going to be there. Um, you're going to be making sure that your um, your pool's gonna be warm and ready to go and all the things that go to ramp up to getting the pool started. But what you're gonna miss on that, if you don't look at your customers, that people are gonna come and they're gonna get grumpy for some sort of idea. What you can do with surveys right now is you can start off by saying, hey, you know, we're gonna have a hand sanitizer here, here, here. Um, I, is that enough for you or are you looking for more? Those are the type of the pieces you can have asking um, to find out what exactly is gonna happen. The other neat thing too, sorry, not neat. One of the bad things that's happening with COVID is that I know Canada, especially in Alberta, where we are based on our oil market, you're going to have a lot of people that are laid off right now, and they will have some time potentially to spend at the pool and get better. So that may be an opportunity to, right now to start serving some of these people that may want volunteer opportunities. They may want the ability to actually do programming and actually provide funding to you. There's a lot of neat things that come out of this, this right now or this situation that we have. So if I were you, I'd spend, to write one of these surveys takes probably about half an hour. If you do something online to pull that stuff off using... Again, SurveyMonkey, you know, Survey Gizmo will actually download you a, a quick little PDF that gives you all those graphs in it. Um, and then you can use that and start figuring stuff out. But mainly the things you should be asking right now aren't, aren't satisfaction stuff. It's going to be when you want to do something, what you want to do, what do you want to get out of this program, how much do you want to pay? Those are the things you want to start doing right now. And also that helps you when it comes to, again, Canada's a little bit different. So I know with our clients, a lot of their budgets have been amalgamated and they haven't been given what their actual new budget's going to be. So what that gives you, it gives you the ability to be the first one to start asking for money, say that now subsidies for the pool aren't going to be 80%. We can do it 60% right now because we're going to run half the amount of staff because we only need these programs. These are what people want right now. And you're not playing this game of we're going to run a program and hope someone's going to show up. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's so difficult. There was a question earlier in the chat box I want to get to, and that's so you've got some data and then how do you use it when you're explaining to perhaps people who don't themselves use the, use the pool? So one municipality I worked for, even though the mayor knew that the pool was popular and that people like to see happy kids on the newspaper, he himself said, I hate pools, I don't go to the pool. So we were always under a cloud. 
how do you, in your experience, like how do you work to, to get the data to be compelling beyond graphs and, and you know, handouts? So there's two things that come with that. Um, uh, again, when you look at council, if there's a mayor, a mayor is only one vote of potentially six, seven, 12, depends how large your, your council is. So trying to find those people that attend the pool, using them as your actual spokesperson is the main thing I'm doing. Now using that data, you're gonna use that as your conduit so that when they actually have those discussions at, at the council level or a board level, that you have three or four people that understand the, the importance of the pool, then it's fine. And again, giving those kind of pieces, even emails, say this is what we're doing, are kind of the key things that come out of that. The other thing too, you can find out what exactly your community is missing. And one thing that can be utilized in pools and arenas, that they're actually community centers, what they become. So yeah, maybe it's not a pool, but it's a place, a safe place for kids to do homework in the hallway. That's a winning story that you can end up using and, and getting that in there. There's a lot of things you can end up using your center for that isn't just water based. You could have a program room that's rented out for birthday parties. There's all these other things that could potentially utilize, and that's a way that you can again spin it away to actually make your space utilized and people want it more. Well, and I was so glad we were having a sidebar conversation in the chat box, Jason, while you were talking about open ended questions. And I personally hate them. But as a data person, even the survey for these webinars, you get a lot of meat from the long form respondents, those five or six percent of people who do actually type in and answer. And I think that's where I was saying in the chat box, I'll restate. It's important that you download that data as a PDF or store it, as you said, Jason, because you can get a lot of sound bites. You can get a lot of clips for Facebook testimonials or, you know, like you can maybe go back to that person if it's appropriate, get a photo and say, are you willing to be on a testimonial? Are you willing to be in the program guide? Are you willing to be, you know, a leader for this initiative? There's a lot of data in there that you can use, but maybe not directly in the survey outcome that you were arguing for. So just to build a, with us in the amount of surveys we end up doing, one thing we like to do is we like to keep our trends. So what we do is that we actually will always have, as you saw in that the example I used, that there is still an open-ended piece of the, of the skills they want to acquire from this. So what is happening is you have your key sort of like five to eight trends you can have. So again, you still get data and then you're still getting that one person that maybe don't have those things that they really want to, you know, learn how to blow bubbles. That's kind of cool. Or maybe they want to tell you a story of why they want to do it. And always having that last piece for other comments, that's where you get those like heartfelt things that, you know, I saved my grandmother once, or like this reminds me of my childhood. Like those really weird heartwarming things that actually help you when it comes to these, these presentations and really fighting for dollars to, to again, make it personalized. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who've never used SurveyMonkey, I only used it for the first time a few years ago. It does help you in writing the questions. Like it recommends if your question is bad, it has algorithms. There's very simple charts. And I know I did a presentation a few years ago that was very significant. And when you showed the raw chart straight from the data, it was very compelling to council and, and my recreation board because it wasn't me, it was the data, right? 490 respondents in 10 days said this. And that was very difficult for them to, to, um, to ignore. I don't remember, Jason, there was a question in the chat box. If, if you remember the four points you made a minute or two ago, if you can restate any of those, I don't know if you remember even. The four points in regards to in this in the presentation or? I'm not sure. Mary had a question about four points. She was asking you to restate them. Um, she's going to add a little bit to that. So okay. we'll see what she's saying. I want to ask as well. Um, so you mentioned a little bit private versus nonprofit. Obviously, we're going to see, you know, if you're a for profit gym or pool, you're going to have different needs than municipal. I loved what you said about like budgets are being cut and we can't just cut everything. Do you, where do you fall on a customer satisfaction survey, not during COVID? How often do you do them or how do you use that with clients to like decide what you're doing as a facility? So there's two ways to do it. Customer satisfaction is different than a program one. So it depends on what, what your mix is. So are people just coming and doing drop-in? If they're just coming and doing a drop-in, that's quarterly, that can be done that way. You should be doing a survey before and at the end of every program. So it doesn't matter if it's a 10-person program or a 100-person swim class. You should be doing that to, again, to find out why, why people are coming there and to see if their goals are being met. Because again, if people are coming to your thing, coming to your swim class, whatever the program is gonna be, and their goals are being met, what's gonna happen is you have 100% satisfaction. Also, if you have that opening, like tell us anything else you have an issue about, they find the water's too cold or, they, or that Johnny keeps peeing in the pool or whatever the issue is, they'll make note of that and you'll find that at that point. So then it feeds in your customer service satisfaction survey that's coming. 
But it, again, when you're looking at drop in and just people that are using it just willy nilly, quarterly is fine, or even once every every buy annually. So that's twice a year you can do it, um, or the two times I don't have doing it. But other than that, if you're doing program, it should be at start and end. Yeah, I think that's a valid point that a lot of people are forgetting. So we might do it with Johnny's swim lessons, you know, for the eight year old, but we're not doing it for our regular members. And there's a tendency to think, you know, the the happy people will speak, you know, shining words and the unhappy people will speak complaining words, regardless of whether we solicit them. But I do agree with you, Jason, that I think there there needs to be we need to know before it shows up on the rant and rave. So even with these webinars, I have a survey, not a lot of people fill it out. I have maybe 40 responses out of 1300 people. That's okay, but it still gives me a pulse for uh, SurveyMonkey, for example, does the net promoter score, if you know what that is. And you know, depending on the webinar, the net promoter score goes up or it goes down. And, and I can take that with a grain of salt, but at least I have the information about what I did wrong, what I can do differently, what I can improve upon. And I think at least I've established that baseline for me and I can determine as an organization if I'm satisfied with that baseline or if I want to reach or if I'm willing to go lower depending on the service delivery that we've agreed to as an organization. And I think one of the things I just want to highlight there is the rant and raves. <clears throat> one of the reasons why you do this data is to combat rat, rant and raves or the Twitter issues or like the troll. Like that's what you end up doing that if all of a sudden you have one person that, that bends the ear of counsel and says, you know what, this, this pool's garbage. We spend too much money on it. Okay, that, that's one person. I have, I have surveyed data for the past year that says each of my programs, not only are they full, because that's something you, you figured that out, but now they're actually meeting goals and the same people are coming and they love this and this is the reasons why. That person won't matter. They can sit there and stand on their soapbox and scream and scream and scream and scream and you actually have actual qualitative and quantitative data. You can say, here, if you want to dispute this here. And I think that's one of the key things that, again, these... If you look at my small two minute survey versus the one we, we originally saw, again, two minute survey, make sure you are trying to figure out what story you're trying to tell and get those questions on there. And then basically that's what you keep on saying that no one can, can dispute the fact that you have, you know, a bunch of kids now that want to be lifeguards because of the fact they took your program. Yeah, and I think we don't even, we can collect data and not even use it right away. Maybe what we have it in our back pocket so we can counterbalance those rant and rave comments I know at least one situation where I got an email from the mayor or from council and it said, you know, Joey's upset about X. Well, what it, what my manager asks what the response is, and then I can go and mine some data from my last survey and say, well, you know, 20% of respondents disagree. I'm not soliciting data for two weeks after the complaint. I already have something that's meaningful that I can perhaps massage or apply to that situation. So I think that's another good way you guys can think about you know, we're not trying to add to your workload, but a survey, doing it once a year, once every six months, whatever you can manage, whether it's you, your programmer, your coordinator, even I've had lifeguards out front with a notepad and paper, like handing out surveys to swimmers, please take it home and bring it back. I think that's helpful because we need that information to ultimately get to new infrastructure, new programs and supporting our, what we're trying to do. So one of the key things on that as well, you don't have to go on this alone. If you look right now, I think your, your total amount of attendees on this was like 140 people that were that were on this. You can sit with your region, call up three other pools, be like, hey, I'm gonna do this survey, you do this survey, we do this survey. Then you now have three surveys done and you also spent 10 minutes on it as opposed to spending half an hour. Then you can utilize that piece. Um, you can also joint by um, SurveyMonkey, you can do that, where basically one person's the, the person that runs it. Now don't tell SurveyMonkey that, but you can buy that. <laughs> Where it's we like 400 bucks a year. Yeah. I'll do it. <laughs> 400 bucks a year. And now you split between 10 people. That's 40 bucks a year. That, that, that's chump change. That, that's what you guys buy for donuts. In, or at least I used to when I worked with people. Um, <laughs> you so you have the ability to do that. So those are the key things that, again, look at what you have right now um, and look at the resources you have. And again, use people like Katie and myself. If, if you're really stuck and you really need help, there's some really amazing consultants out there too that can give you a hand with this stuff. So. So I want to circle back to Mary's question, but we'll frame it, Jason, as what are some basics that you want to achieve from a survey? Like if you're giving bullet points like basic data or basic, you know, what's it doing? So again, the base thing you're looking for is you want to try and tell a story out of the data you're looking for. So out of that, you need to figure out, again, who your audience is, what you want to tell out of it. And uh, what you want to tell is basically the type of person that's attending your facility you know, I know that another big thing is trying to figure out, you know, new Canadians versus existing or new Americans versus existing Americans. Asking that question, you know, when did you come to, to America? If you find that 
your population matched that and that can match something. It really, the key thing is trying to tell a story that's going to match up to either your funding model, your municipal government, grants, or something you feel really po positive about that's going to tell a story about. Those are kind of the key things. I'm hoping that answered the question properly. Yeah, I think that's good. And the recording of this webinar will be available so people can rewatch it. I'm going to do a last call for questions in the chat box. I'm going to ask Jason a few other things. But if you have questions, please pop them in the chat box so that I can see them. Um, where do you fall, Jason? Do you have to give out prizes for surveys to be effective? Like, do there have to be gift cards? Or how do you, you know, make sure that there's good engagement? On, on, a, on a five, ten question survey, no. If you're looking, so... If you're trying to get other people, um, it's a long survey and you want them to actually spend some time, like 20, 30 minutes, yeah, doing something along those lines that they feel they're getting paid for their time. But again, if it's something, surveys, you can't pull information out of someone that doesn't want to give it to you. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if the, the prize is a million dollars, that one person that just doesn't care is not going to fill it out. So giving prizes, I'm not a big fan of giving prizes because again, you're still going to get people there that, that are going to give that. What works the best if you're giving out a paper survey or you're actually in, within the facility is standing there and staring at the person. Give them something and stand there with an iPad, piece of paper, and just stare at it. It's, okay. a, it's, a, it's a five minute survey. Get it done. Um, timeline if, it, if it's a household survey, again, it's going to be two weeks. You're going to find, again, you're going to get those two, two people on either side. But again, that's why you don't use your survey to create your problem. You're using that survey to help uh, illuminate, not illuminate, sorry, support the decisions you're trying to make. So start with the end in mind as opposed to just open willy nilly high in the sky? Do you like mermaiding? Do you want the pool to be warmer? Like very focused. And then would you do multiple surveys like programming, operations, fitness, rec? Or would you try and do like one question from each pocket and then do another survey six months later? So again, if, if, you're, if you have a captive audience and the goal is to deal with captive audience, then you should do one survey per each program. And those surveys should be different. So whether it's a swimming program, whether it's a fitness one, those ones should be different. If you're doing a random, let's figure some stuff out, then you're just using your users on that one. Then you can use some point of question like what kind of, it, it's based on the questions you're asking. So for example, what kind of activities are you not presently doing at the pool that you would like to do is something. So if someone like, I'm not getting any art done, then you can figure out is that something we want to do. But the thing is you can also open up the idea if you ask those questions of sort of within the municipality or the city or town, what opportunities or pursuits are you not fulfilling? Never ask what they're doing, because we don't care, because I can look at, I can look at the, the, the activation guide and say, hey, there's 30, pro 30 pottery programs, we don't care. What we want to know is, again, asking what they want, not what they currently do. So again, what, are you, what pursuit would you like to do that is currently not offered? And if someone's cooking, then again, you either use that piece or you give it to one of your recreation people or one of the other people within your network to try and fulfill that. So I want to talk briefly, Jason, I know you're an expert in community consultation, and I want you to distinguish for me, because I didn't understand this for many years, and there's probably people still here who don't. When you have a customer, a client, a rate payer saying, well, I want a meeting because of X, or I want, I think you should ask the community in an in-person facilitated community consultation, what are the differences between a survey and a consultation, and which one, like, which one should people use for most of their stuff? So there's a spectrum that, that's out there for community consultation. So it depends on what kind of, uh, I use the word influence or power you want to give to the public. So mm -hmm. if you want something that you don't give them very much power and you're just consulting with them, so you're going to ask their opinion, are they going to provide it and you're going to use that information? Surveys are the best way to do it. Um, it's a way to get a blanket that figures out what's going on. If you just want to, if you really want to empower the community and let them do whatever they want, then that's a different whole bag of worms and that that I wouldn't suggest in any of your um, clients when it comes to pools. That's more when you're looking at, you know, uh, there's a blank piece of land, you know, we have this blank room, those type of things. Yeah, and I think the big piece that I want to finish on because I'm not seeing any questions on the chat box is how do you feel that we're responsible to actually implement or use the data? Because it's a pet peeve of mine. Let's say I'm working with uh, instructor candidates and I give them, they ask for feedback, I give them feedback and then they ignore me or don't implement it. What's your experience been when we ask rate payers or clients to do surveys, but then we shelve it or we don't implement it? What's our responsibility to use that data in your opinion? Well, then why are you wasting my time and your time to do a survey if you're not going to use it? The thing is, if you're going to do it again, 
the goal of a survey or getting this type of data is basically to support whatever you want to do it. So you should not be, you know, asking people pointless questions. You should be asking stuff that you can utilize. Now, whether, again, if an instructor you're asking, you know, is an instructor good, bad, or ugly, and they choose not to use that information, then you should be looking at a new instructor because mm -hmm. clearly they don't want to grow and learn. But if you're asking them for information on, you know, whether the pool's cold or, or warm, and you find out everyone wants it warm, but you don't want to tell anyone that, that everyone wants it warm, then I, I'm not sure maybe you need a new job. <laughs> I guess I'm thinking, what about if it disproved? Like, I've definitely had situations where I thought A, and then everybody thought B, and I was happy to implement it. But what about a situation where B is unsafe, or we legally can't do it in terms of like municipal, we have to follow procurement, or we have to, I don't know, I guess I was just thinking if you get an answer that you can't actually do, or that the council says we're not going to do it, then where do we go? So if, if for example, again, the survey is not supposed to make make new problems or new issues for you. The idea is to, to support okay, that's the story. Okay. So that, that's the key of that one. Um, when I've seen that happen is, is, for example, you ask a whole bunch of people open-ended questions and they, they all decide that they want to demolish the pool and build a skateboard park. Yep. So cool. That, I'm, glad, I'm glad that happened. However, you and your ministry of role or even council's role, if that comes out and council's like, oh, look, everyone wants to destroy the skateboard park and you're only going to use survey data for it, then, then that council's horrible and you should be moving because they, they clearly don't know what they're doing either. But again, a survey is supposed to do two things. It's just one piece to gather some information to help support something else. And again, you're not trying to find out, you're not trying to create new, new ideas out of it. You're trying to support already existing ideas. Unless it's like, hey, give us an idea for a new program and if 50 people want to do it. But something that actually has some financial cost to it, you're not going to give a community member the ability to decide whether or not a pool lives or dies based on one survey. Um, sure. It should be a bunch of different types of opportunities that go on. And again, when you go to council or your board or whatever else, if they just use that and you're not able to state that, you know, we have a cost recovery of this, uh, we benchmark against these things, like there's all these other pieces that go into it um, to, to make that work. So if that ever happens, feel free call for some help to, to help mitigate that. I know I've, I've done some interesting work like that um, to help fix some of those issues that occur because people just don't understand what that means. It's not, it's not A equals B. A supports potentially B, C, D all the way down of other options that could come out of it. Awesome. Okay, so I think we'll leave it there. I'm gonna make a couple of announcements, but we'll say thank you to Jason Simitak from Quantum Recreation near Edmonton, Alberta in Canada. Um, it's very hard, so you guys know, it's so hard to translate on webinars. Jason's a very enthusiastic, walking around the room kind of guy, and so to be chained to the computer, it doesn't give you the full expression of his enthusiasm and creativity. I'm, so, I'm stuck uh, to a, I'm tethered. <laughs> You're tethered, <laughs> like a dog. So, in the, it's such a bad analogy, but like a dog in the backyard. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I want to make a couple of announcements. Jason, you can turn off your camera unless you want to sit and be pretty during the announcements. No, I'm uh, good. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I have put in the chat box um, some links. We're doing a competition today. So there is a free giveaway. The Canadian Red Cross has donated. Sorry, I'm just plugging in my tablet. Canadian Red Cross has donated a free registration to their virtual Saskatchewan and Manitoba Aquatic Conference that is happening in two weeks. I am a presenter along with several other people. If you are interested in receiving a, I guess competing, they're giving away one free registration to the online conference that is virtual. Anybody can attend anywhere in the world. There will also be recordings. If you're interested, there is a post today on Instagram, the Lakeview Aquatic Consultants Instagram page. If you click on the photo of me with an instructor, rash guard, comment what program session you're most interested in. I'll do a giveaway later today on Instagram stories. You only have about 30 more minutes to go and comment on that photo. I keep it open until the end of the webinar. And please make sure you answer the secret question because it's not just a dot or an X. You need to actually reply what session you're interested in attending. Uh, Jason, somebody's asking Jason about your art. I don't know if he's still here in the background. Jason, if you are, add your art, any information to the chat box. I want to briefly mention the sessions for next week. So today being Friday, we have a few sessions still coming up. We're not going to be doing the webinars past May into June. We are going to be finishing up. There is a lot of content available online. People are busy. 
and voting with your attendance, I can tell that people are starting to get to a point where they don't need more online content from me. I don't also have anything to add necessarily. So next week on Monday, we have mermaiding and lifeguard games. So if you're interested in new activity at your facility, a great way to get staff engaged, enthusiastic about training. I have popped that registration link in the chat box. Next Wednesday, May 6th, I'm super excited. We have Trevor Sherwood from New Jersey, pool operation management. He is an expert witness in the United States for drowning court cases, both civil and criminal. He'll be talking about a lot of the different things that he sees in court proceedings when he's deposed as an expert witness against pools regarding things that they didn't do. He'll be sharing some of his expertise and information that he thinks would be beneficial to other pool operators and managers. And then next Friday, we have Kate Connell from the city of Iowa City. Many of you know her from the Equitable Aquatics Facebook group online. She's gonna be presenting with her colleague from the city of Iowa City, Sydney. They will be talking about the inclusive aquatics inventory. So you know this is very different from Adrian's accessibility session back in April. This will be focused on things like socioeconomic uh, accessibility of your facility, programs, different community needs. It's not accessibility in terms of just mobility or able-bodiedness, okay? Um, other couple of things, if you joined us a little bit late, the show notes for today, I'll put those back in the chat box. The show notes for Monday's session are also now live, Monday, the April 27th. I'm just finishing up Wednesday, April 29th. Those were not done yet. I've been a bit behind this week while I do certified pool operator training. I'm just, sorry, scrolling. Whoops. Sorry. I just lost. Sorry, it's a bit slow. So Monday, April 27th, show notes are now in the chat box. I am working on the show notes for Wednesday. You should see those up over the weekend, as well as the show notes for this session will be updated. Last thing I will mention before I let you guys go, if you are looking for the Lakeview Aquatic Consultants, our weekly during COVID, monthly during non-COVID, Newsletter sign up. I send out an email on Sunday nights. So if you're interested in getting that email, uh, it will be coming out Sunday night. Thank you, Joaquin. I see, well, you're in California, so Disneyland. This is Disney World, my pen from last year when we were in Florida. My favorite souvenir. I don't buy a lot of souvenirs. We travel quite a bit, but I love these. I have a few of these. So the newsletter sign up is on the show notes. I'll also pop in our Facebook page. I'll be announcing two different sessions. I meant to say that sooner today. So I'm just finished, I'm just finalizing the sessions of people I had talked to. I'm not adding any more sessions beyond the ones that I have already finalized. So coming up Wednesday, May, I just need to look at a calendar, May 13th. We're going to be having a health and safety session talking about non-scary tips. So the perspective is not going to be COVID health and safety. It's going to be documentation procedures, policies, how to update your health and safety documentation in general for your aquatics facility. That is going to be with my colleague formerly from High River, Kira. She's going to make a session that's going to be applicable to as many people as possible about updating health and safety documentation. And then Friday, May 15th, I also have my former colleague from High River, Lisa Reinders, Community Services Director, colleague of Jason. She'll be talking grant writing. So I know that's going to be a huge topic for many people. How do you do a grant? How do you write a grant? How do you apply for a grant? Not specific to your state or province, but just basically if you see a grant application online, what are some strategies for putting together a proposal that might be successful? So that's been a topic I've been meaning to do for a number of weeks. I'll add one or two more sessions after that and then we will call it quits for now. Um, I appreciate all of you that are still here. These webinars have been wonderful. The community has been wonderful. Thank you again for the uh, nomination, whoever nominated me for the Association of Aquatic Professionals, competitor of the month for May. I so appreciate that. 
The pool aid webinars are not disappearing forever. I will look in the future and see other ways that we can uh, engage as a community after COVID and stay connected. But I think we are reaching the end in May in terms of what people have time for. And I know myself, I am starting to get a little bit tired and have other things that I'd like to work on before we start to ramp back up with our pools in July and August. Okay, so I'll be here for a few more minutes. If you have any other comments, anything you wanna chat about, I'm here. Uh, have a good weekend. Thank you for spending an hour and a half, two hours with us on Friday, May 1st. Uh, this web webinar is recording, so I'll download the file, pop it up on YouTube this weekend. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.